thank you very much for uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks for this nice opportunity to to speak here so um uh, as the title says this will be um the first part of a four-part lecture on, on toric symplectic manifolds. I will give two, the first two parts, and then Felix will talk um, on, on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, the goal today is to give you um, just an introduction to toric symplectic manifolds. And this will be used then later on in the, in the, in the following lectures. So today it should be very basic. Um, so on one hand, it should be very basic, but on the other hand, I need to cover a lot of ground. So um, it's, 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 I might have to, to omit some details, um, but uh, you should anyway, so uh, I'm a little bit under pressure maybe with time, but you should, you should interrupt me because otherwise uh, I think this is the goal to, to learn something and especially the beginning so it should be very accessible. So please please interrupt me if you have any questions and then I can go into as much detail as you like. Um, okay, so let's maybe start. So today's, this is an outline of today's, what I would like to talk about today. So the first or the zeroth paragraph, let's say, or the zeroth chapter will just be, um, just be a short introduction, um, especially to Hamiltonian torus sections. This will be kind of, one of the main things we'll be looking at. And then I'll talk about a, a special case, namely toric manifolds. So they are a special case of Hamiltonian torus actions. And then I will do a complete example, basically. Um, so I will go through all of what I want to tell you in the general case, but I'll do it to, for CP2. So in particular, I'll, I'll already review the del Zond construction for CP2 in a sense. Um, and then if, if, if time permits, I will do the general case in the end. So I will talk about this, um, this del Zond construction and uh, in, the same, in the same setting also about, uh, about symplectic reduction because the two are, the two are very, very related. Um, but uh, bear in mind that maybe I cannot get to this, to this last part. So I, I try to go through the whole talk and this is about, so the first, for um, parts is about 60 minutes. So we'll see in the end um, where we're at. And I, I've given you some references, um, some references here. The, I, I would say the standard ones are maybe uh, Ana Canasta Silva, um, symplectic toric manifolds and uh, Michel Audin. Those are really the classics on on, uh, on Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian torus actions. So the, the book by Odin is a little more general in its, in its focus, but um, uh, Anna Canasta Silva really focuses on, on the toric case. So uh, this is more and more specific. And then there are three other references, which I all like a lot and which I use a lot um, by, uh, by Eckhart Meinrenken. This is, is script on symplectic geometry one by Johnny Evans, which has a slightly different focus on Lagrangian torus vibrations, but it's very, it's very accessible. And then one of my favorites, I guess, if you want to learn about, about toric geometry is uh, Victor Gilma. Um, he wrote many, many different things, but uh, my favorite is this, is this book of his. Um, and uh, this is really, this is really nice, nice text, I think, too. To, to learn about, especially about the Delson construction. Um, okay, but let's let's start with um, with an overview on on symplectic manifolds and Hamiltonian torus sections. So the the goal is really to start at zero, basically. So I'm giving you the very basic definitions, but um, I'm, I'm not giving you that many examples or details because otherwise this would uh, Will take up too much time. So I take a symplectic manifold uh, M omega. So this is a, a smooth manifold equipped with a, with a closed with a closed two form. So uh, this is this omega. Closed means that the omega is zero, and I require it to be non-degenerate in the sense that um, if I take this natural this natural map here going from the 
tangent bundle to the cotangent bundle, then I want this to be an isomorphism. So this is like if you take a Riemannian metric, it's the same principle. Um, and via this, this isomorphism, I can do something interesting. If I take if I take a function, so a smooth function on the manifold, and I take its differential, then I get a, a one form. But to this one form, I can associate a vector field via omega, via this isomorphism, basically. And vector fields of this type are called Hamiltonian vector fields. So this is kind of my, my definition here, Hamiltonian vector fields. And this is the equation, the corresponding equation defining, okay, so there's an H missing here. So it should be XH. Um, this is an implicit definition of this vector field. And if you write it out in coordinates, um, then it's it's the it's the classical Hamilton Hamilton's equations from uh, from from physics, from from classical mechanics basically. And such a function I call this a Hamiltonian function. It's just a smooth function, but I think of it as something something slightly different. That's why it has its own name. And uh, this this gives you a Hamiltonian vector field. And if I integrate it. Um, sorry, I should really log out of my email, otherwise you can hear whenever I get a mail. Sorry about that. Um, if I integrate it, I get a Hamiltonian flow. So I can follow kind of the, the, the Hamiltonian vector field, and this gives me a Hamiltonian flow. And in general, Hamiltonian flows are slightly more general because um, the, the Hamiltonian function might be itself time dependent meaning that the Hamiltonian vector field might vary. Um, when you start integrating, you allow the Hamiltonian vector field to vary as well. Um, but actually, I won't need it. I won't need this too much in this talk. So uh, usually, if it's, uh, so if it's not time dependent, not time dependent, I will call it autonomous. And um, most, um, most Hamiltonians appearing in this talk will be autonomous. Here are some, so here are just some basic, basic properties. So Hamiltonian flows preserve, preserve the symplectic form. And somehow interestingly, they also preserve the Hamiltonian itself. So the Hamiltonian, when you, when you flow, when you flow along it, it stays constant, um, at least in the autonomous case. So this is very important. In the non-autonomous case, this will change. Let's make, um, to illustrate all of this, let's make a, a quick example, one of the simplest ones you can imagine. As, um, as a symplectic manifold, I take, the, I take the plane, so R2 or C, depending on preference. And the, the symplectic form will just measure the area. So it's a constant, you know, uh, I take kind of, plane and in every point in every tangent plane here i take the same um the same form and it just measures measures the area and as a hamiltonian i will take um x squared plus y squared and so maybe one of you knows this is the classical example so what what will be the Hamil what will be the hamiltonian flow of this without without doing computations so you of course, you can do computations, uh, but uh, do you have any any ideas? Well, as a hint, you can look at you, you as a hint. You can look at this actually. So, the Hamiltonian has to be preserved under the flow. And so this means that you need to stay in the level sets of your Hamiltonian. And the level sets of this function, of this function are circles. So you need to preserve this, the, the family of circles. And so there isn't much you can do. Of course, you might twist them in a weird way, but um, here it's very, it's very nice. Uh, your flow is just, your flow will just be given by rotation. Meaning that um, that all of the flow lines close up after after the same time, and the time here is pi if you if you work out the details. 
Um, so you get a rotation. And this is very nice because it defines. Um, oh, someone gave the answer, and someone gave the answer in the chat, but I was too slow. Yeah. So circles is the right answer. Yeah. Thanks for this. Um, so this defines an, an S1 action because you go back to the identity after a fixed time. And those are those are kind of the things that we're looking at here. So more generally, um, I will call the smooth S1 action, I will call it Hamiltonian if it if it arises in this way. So if it comes from a Hamiltonian flow, which is the identity after you, you can be reparameterized, you can say after time one. Um, equal to the identity, then this will be a, will be a Hamiltonian uh, um, circle action. And so they are quite different from general smooth circle actions because they have very strong topological properties. Um, and let's, but let's, let, let's look at, uh, at, at another example. So, um, as a, as a space, this time I will take the sphere, the two sphere. So it looks like this. And I view the two sphere really kind of embedded with the standard embedding in R3. So I look at it like this. And I take the corresponding area form, which comes from this embedding as a, as a symplectic form. And as, as my Hamiltonian will just be the projection to the Z coordinate. So I, I take one of the one of the coordinates here. So let's let's say it's X, Y, and Z. I take the Z coordinate and I project to it. This is the Hamiltonian flow. Uh, I mean, sorry, this is the Hamiltonian function. Now again, you can ask, so what is the what is the Hamiltonian flow? And now, now, now I can guess. <laughs> now you can guess. <laughs> Yes, so it would just be just be the circles um, because they are of constant z coordinate, right? And um, again, this does not give you. So one should watch out. Uh, this does not give you how they are parameterized, right? It just gives you geometrically what the orbits look like, but they may be twisted in a certain way. But it turns out that again, this time it's again well chosen, so that really you get. Um, so let me move to a picture here. Really, you get a homogeneous rotation around the z-axis, and um, so again, again, we get an we get an S one action because after after a certain time, we're at the identity again. Okay, so these were the kind of most basic examples, but let let's do something slightly more complicated with um, with this definition in mind. So. Now I look at two, two circle actions. So I have two Hamiltonians, which generate something, some, some circle actions on, on your symplectic manifold. And I make a definition. I say that um, they commute if their, their Poisson bracket vanishes. So maybe you know the Poisson bracket from, from classical mechanics. But if you don't know it, then um, here's a, a definition of it. Namely, I just plug in the Hamiltonian vector fields of H and F. So H and F are my Hamiltonians. I plug in their vector fields into the symplectic form. And this I want to, to van I want this to vanish everywhere. So this is a constant, constant function equaling, equaling zero. And when this is true, then I say that they commute. And interestingly, this implies that the flows commute. So the Hamiltonian flows um, commute as flows in the sense that uh, so if I if I am at some point in the manifold so let's say I start at this point then I apply the first flow sorry I apply the first flow so this is maybe I flow along f and then I flow along h then this is the same as flowing first along H and then along F. So this kind of diagram always, or this kind of uh, concatenation here always closes up. So this is what it means uh, 
This is what it means for, for the flows to commute. And this is interesting because this means that we get a torus action. So we can, we can look at the, at the circle actions together and, um, and define a torus action by applying, by applying their, their respective flows. Um, of course, I need this, I need the flows to commute otherwise, because I mean, the torus is an abelian group, so there the elements commute. And if, uh, and if this, does, as this does not work on the level of flows, then I won't get a torus action. So this is a necessary, necessary thing. And a torus action arising, arising in this way is, uh, is called a Hamiltonian torus action. And I will denote the torus by TK. So TK, you can think of it as K copies of, I mean, the product of K copies of S1 of the circle. And a very, a very important object that 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 we will that we will work with is is the moment map, and in this case the moment map is just there's a more general definition of moment map, but in this case it's really just the the Hamiltonians generating the the corresponding circle actions. So um, this gives me a map which I denote by mu. Gives me a map um, going from M to R K. So K is the same dimension as the one of the torus. And usually people work with, instead of working with the, directly with the group action, people prefer to work with, with the moment map because it has very nice properties. Um, and actually we'll see one of the nice properties, which is, was quite remarkable. Uh, I think people found this very surprising and astonishing when this theorem, theorem was proven first. And this was uh, at the beginning of, of the 80s. And it was independently proved by Atia and uh, Gilmar Sternberg. And it says, that, uh, it says that the image of the moment map is a, is a convex rational polytope. So it's really it's some object in RK which is somehow has a linear structure. So it's, you can think of it, I don't know. We'll see many examples, of course, but some, some polytope inside, some polytope inside, inside, a, inside a vector space. Uh, could you say, what was it like a moment map again? Yes, it's just, so let's say, Let's say in the in the case of two in the case of two Hamiltonians. So let's say in a case where I have H one and H two, and they commute in this nice way using the, the Poisson brackets. Then I just look at at their product basically. I mean, one go, one goes to a copy of R, and the other one also goes to a copy of R. So if I take two of them, they will go to uh, they will go to R two. And this I call the moment map. You don't need to commute to define moment map, moment map, right? It doesn't have to commute, no. Um, but then the moment map won't have this nice, um, this nice property of of, of the polyto. I mean, won't have as image a polyto. Mm -hmm. This really needs the commute, the commutativity, because it needs a torus action. Okay. Um, and this object I will call the the moment polytope. So this is the definition of the moment polytope. It's just the image of the moment. Okay, so so this is basically all I'm going to say about kind of the general case of of Hamiltonian torus actions because I would like to, to move to a special case now. So to toric manifolds are, they are a special case, or let's say really a strict special case of um, Hamiltonian uh, TK spaces. So spaces carrying a Hamiltonian, a Hamiltonian torus action. Um, so before, before giving you the definition, I'd like to motivate it in a, a little bit. So these were the two examples that I've mentioned so far. Um, 
um, that I've mentioned explicitly. So the sphere and the plane. So this image we've already seen, and this is the same image as the one we've seen before. It's just that I'm thinking of my Hamiltonian more as a Morse function. So I have this projection to, um, to the half line. And in this case, kind of the, 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 um, the moment polytope is the, um, the segment here. So this is my moment polytope. And in the non-compact case of the plane, my moment polytope will just be a half line. And there's an interesting, there's a very interesting remark you can make, namely this moment polytope already encodes much of the geometry of the space because um, there's the following thing you can, you can, you can notice. The, I'm looking at, so let's say we look at kind of slices of the manifold. So I fix two heights here, maybe H1 and H2. And I look at the slice of the space contained between these two heights. So at, at the pre-image on the, on the manifold. And then I measure the area. And it turns out this area is proportional to the length of the slice. So in other words, if I, if I take another slice somewhere, so let's say I take another slice here at almost the extreme of the sphere, which has the same length. So let's say my, my drawing is kind of bad, but let's say this length is the same. So both have length L. And then I look at the corresponding pre-image here. This thing here. This slice will have the same area as, so th these two slices will have the same area. So let's say this is area one and area two. And this is length one and length two. And the lengths being equal is equivalent to the areas being equal. So I need to think of it uh, at first, this seems maybe surprising because it looks, maybe you would think that if you move up, then you get a smaller area, but it, it's compensated by the fact that the sphere is curved. So um, this is quite interesting. And, and the same happens, the same happens on the other side of the, where, where we look at this, um, at, at R2, the same kind of phenomenon happens. And this is a general fact about certain types of moment moves. And this means kind of, this hints at something more profound. Namely, it hints at the fact that the moment map establishes a relation between the geometry, the symplectic geometry of the space, because the symplectic geometry is about measuring areas somehow, and about the geometry of the, of the moment polytope or the combinatorics of the moment polytope. Um, and this can actually be general, I mean, drastically generalized or even strengthened this, uh, this claim because, um, so let's say the, the ambitious goal would be to, um, to go from, go from, first go from Hamiltonian TK spaces to polytopes Using, using this construction by Atia Gilmer Sternbeck. And then maybe in some cases we can even reconstruct the manifold. I mean, I mean we, can, we can recover something from, from the point. Well, this looks ambitious and it is, but um, if, you, if you restrict your attention to the right category of, of submanifold, I mean of manifolds, this works. And this is exactly uh, Delson's theorem. So, um, and of course, the, the category of space that I'm talking about are, are toric symplectic manifolds. So once you add this property of them being toric, then, then you get such a, such a bijection basically. And okay, so this is, this is Delzon's theorem. This was proved in, in 88 by uh, Thomas, Thomas Delzon. Um, and so I've written here del sound polytopes because they have special properties. I will, I will, I will say what they are later. 
Um, it's also a sub, you also need to look at the subset of polytopes basically. And here there are some equivalences that I've, that I've drawn that are not this important. Uh, here it's just an action of, of GLNZ. So you can think of this as, so inside of Rn you have a lattice sitting there. So you have Zn inside of Rn. And GLNZ is, is our lattice automorphism. So this is the symmetry group of the lattice effect. And the equivalents on the other side are um, equivariant symplectomorphisms. So it's symplectomorphisms, but which preserve the, the group action. Um, okay. Now I've, I've said many things, but I haven't given you the definition of what a toric, um, what a toric symplectic manifold is. And the definition is, um, Oh, sorry, there was another comment that I've missed in, in the chat. Yes, this is exactly Archimedes. This is exactly Archimedes principle, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so there are theorems about moment maps, which are somehow far reaching generalizations of, of Archimedes principle in the sense that you can al always measure something downstairs in the polytope and associate to it some, some measure inside the, inside the symplectic manifold. And, uh, so you can push it very far. Um, and, uh, okay, so let me return to the, to the um, definition of what toric means. So toric basically means that the action of the, I mean, the, the, the dimension of the torus that's acting is very large. So before we looked at, in the general context, we looked at TK actions on, on uh, um, a symplectic manifold of dimension 2n. But in the toric context, we need to say, we require the maximal dimension here. So we really want an n-dimensional torus acting on a 2n-dimensional space. And we require this action to be effective. Effective just means that the whole torus is acting somewhere. I mean, there's no, there's no non-trivial element in the torus which, which acts trivially on the whole manifold. Otherwise, you could quotient and go to a smaller torus in a sense. So, I mean... This is just to assure you that you're not cheating when you say you have a TN action on a 2N dimensional manifold. Otherwise you could take the trivial TN action or something. Um, and you can see that this, this was actually the case in our two examples. So in, in these examples, we had surfaces, so two dimensional things, and we had a one dimensional torus acting because we had a circle action. Um, Okay, so now we get something interesting here because um, on one hand, you have this symplectic world where you have many complicated variants and many difficult questions. And on the other hand, you have um, this world of combinatorics somehow or of geometry of polytopes which looks easier and usually is easier. Um, and the Delson's theorem tells you that whenever you have a symplectic phenomenon, there should be a dictionary between your symplectic thing happening on one side and combinatorics just of, of some polytope happening on the other side. So when you, when you work out a, a problem completely, then you should have a one-to-one tra -one translation between between symplectic questions and uh, questions about polytopes. And I think this is maybe the main theme of, of this lecture series um, to establish this translation for some of the, for some of the symplectic phenomena. And the, the ones that we're interested in are, um, are embedding problems. So this will be Felix's talk. Uh, and on the other hand, we're, we'll be interested in, in Lagrangian submanifolds and um, more specifically exotic tori, so exotic Lagrangian tori. 
Um, my talk tomorrow will be on this topic. Uh, so I will introduce what, what, this, what this is. And I will talk about the Chekhanov Taurus tomorrow. So this will be my second talk. And Felix will talk about the Vyanot. So, but they should be seen in this kind of general framework. Um, okay, I, I promised you, are there any are there any questions or remarks so far? Uh, maybe I'm going a bit fast here. What are the equivalences on pol polyhedra that give you the same correspond to the same? Sorry. What are the equivalences on polyhedra that give you the same um, simplistic manifold? The equivalences of polyhedra are just um, are just this action of of GLNZ. It's it. Sorry, GLNZ. GLNZ takes, it should take one to the other. That's it. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So actually, the the lattice. So this lattice, this ZN in RN, is a very is a very important object here in this study of, of moment polytopes. Um, I won't go in. Uh, I won't go into the details, but it. Um, when you don't preserve the lattice, um, this might mess things up because the lattice somehow, I mean, objects of GL and Z somehow correspond to automorphisms of the torus because the torus is RN quotiented by ZN. Just to make sure I understand, the lattice for you is just a collection of N vectors with uh, integral and That's right. and generate all RN, spam all RN. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you can think of it as Zn inside Rn. Yes. Mm. Is this the only one theorem about that correspondence between the polytops and the symplectic manifolds? And of, of course, from left to right. I mean, when, you, when you're given a polytop, uh, this is the on, only only theorem that gives that kind of correspondence on the symplectic ah. manifold part. Or. Um. I would say essentially yes. There are differences. I mean, there are differences in the construction. You can attack it from different angles, but I think they're all. I think they're all equivalent in some way. The result, of course, has to be the same. But I mean, they look different on the surface. The constructions, but it's always it's always something having to do with going to a larger space and doing symplectic reduction. So the, the one that I will present will be the, will be the, the classical Delson construction. And all the others are at least in, in somehow in the spirit of the thing related. Mm -hmm. So the set on the left is uh, symplectic manifolds with effective torus action, right? That's the set, not just. That's right, but with an effective torus action of, of this maximal dimension. Maximum dimension. So if you have a six, if you have a six-dimensional manifold, you need a three-dimensional effective Hamiltonian torus action. Another question I seem to remember is uh, moment moment map point the cotangent uh, bundle of Lie algebra or something like this in the more general circumstances, right? Uh, yes, I mean I mean in general, th this is a this is a very nice remark. I mean I sh I should have said this maybe. But there's a more general construction where you have just a smooth Lie group acting on, on the symplectic manifold. And you, you can define Hamiltonian G actions for, for any compact or maybe non-compact Lie groups. And then mu, so oh, sorry, this should be, so this should be mu, not M. Mu then goes from M to the dual of the Lie algebra. So, this is the general concept of the moment. There's no Delzan type of theorem in this situation, right? There is no. There are, I mean, there are some Delzan type theorems, but it's not as clear what 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 one one should say, because um, it's not even that obvious which groups G to look at. I mean. Mm. 
I think the short answer is no, there's no, there's, there's nothing as clear as the Delzon theorem where we really have a one-to-one -one correspondence. But um, people, of course, are very interested in this. So there are many works around uh, non-abelian, the non-abelian case. But there are some theorems on the, I mean, the convexity part is now pretty well understood, I think. So the first theorem that I presented about this, uh, the convex, uh, convex polytopes. So there are some, some analogous theorems. Um, okay. I should, I should now tell you what, um, what this adjective means that I added to the polytopes. So I said Delzon polytopes. And this is also quite a strong restriction because um, it means that our polytope has to be simple and smooth simple meaning that um, in the n-dimensional case you have you have exactly n facets meeting at every at every vertex so he, the easiest thing is to look at an example so if i look at at this vertex here in r3 then this is simple because there are three incoming edges but this one is not simple because there are four incoming edges so like this um, so this is not that restrictive, but the smooth part is very restrictive because it tells you that the outgoing edges should form an integral basis of the lattice. So if I take the outgoing vectors here, and I need to normalize them in some way because I have, I mean, if I just look at the edge, I have some choice. Um, and I will normalize them in the following way, I will take the first vector which hits the lattice. So because we're working with rational polytopes, there is some point at which you will hit the lattice. So if you take, I don't know, if you take one half, one third, you, you should renormalize it and you should go to, you should multiply by six so that it's, it's, really, it, it's really integral components and you should replace it by three, two. And I do this for all of these vectors. And the vectors that I obtain, they, they lie, of course, in this lattice, but they should also be a, be a basis of this lattice over the integers. Okay, this needs some, some time to, to digest maybe. So I, I've, I've made, an exa I've made some, some examples here. Um, so let's say, let's say my vertex is, looks like this. Maybe the moment, maybe the polytope continues here. So let's say this is a vertex of my polytope. And then taking the first vectors hitting the lattice are, are, just, are just these two, these two vectors here. And this, uh, so this vertex will be smooth because if I look at any point here in Z2, so my lattice, uh, I call it lattice, but it's just a copy of Z2. Um, any of these points can be represented as an as an as a linear combination, as an integral linear combination of of the two basis vectors. So, if, let's say this is just e one and this is e two, of course. The second one, the second, this second vertex is non-smooth. So again, I've taken the first ones hitting the the lattice, but now I now I have a problem here because you see that these points here. For example, I cannot write them as, or, or if I write them as a linear combination of, of the two vectors, then my coefficients will not be integers because I would take, I would, I would have to take one half of this second vector V2 here. So, um, so this vertex would not be smooth. And here there's another, there's another example of a smooth one, which is kind of a little more non-trivial. And the criterion for, for, for them to be, to be smooth is just that the determinant should be, the determinant formed by the two, by the two vectors should be equal to one or minus one, maybe if you switch them. So maybe the absolute value should be equal to one. This is equivalent to this smoothness condition. And is here it, you see that- Is this yeah. same as, then I complete these two vectors to parallelogram 
there shouldn't be any point lying inside. Yes, that's right. That's another criteria. Yes. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So what what Simon just said is that um, if I complete them to to parallelogram like this, um, there shouldn't be point lying inside a lattice point. So here I have a lattice point, and here I don't. In the in the, in the last one, I I haven't. So I can't draw it because it's too skewed. But so. Yes, so this is in two dimensions. This is called Pick's, Pick's theorem, right? Because you can compute the area, which is the determinant here, using using by account of of points lying inside, or lattice points lying inside, and lattice points lying on the boundary. And uh, if you apply Pick's theorem, it tells you that the determinant is one if and only if the number of points in the interior is zero. Uh, um, and there's a a more general version of this, and this works in any dimension. Um, yes, okay, so let's move to just quickly going over some examples. Um, most of these I've already discussed in dimension two. So I have a compact one, which is S2. Oh, and I should say, I should have said this earlier. Um, people sometimes Sometimes people, when they say toric, they mean compact, uh, compact toric, but I don't. <laughs> I, I, I would really like to include C, for example, C and CK also in my definition of toric uh, because they will be very useful later. Um, but uh, maybe we can say compact toric and non-compact toric. And so, one new example is, is this is the cylinder here where the moment polytope would just be the line. So you just project um, you just project um, horizontally and your orbits will just be uh, will just be these circles of constant height. Okay, so let's move to higher dimensions. One thing I can do is, kind of an obvious thing, I can take products. And products of toric manifolds will again be toric. Everything just goes through um, in, the, in the definitions. And their moment polytopes will also be the product of the corresponding of the corresponding polytopes. So if you see a polytope, which is a product of two Delzant polytopes, you, you immediately know that you're working with a, with a manifold, which is a product with, and which decomposes where everything decomposes. The symplectic form decomposes, the action decomposes into two subtori, basically, and so on. And um, okay, so I have S2 times S2 here, which is a which is a square because it's um, um, interval times interval. And here I have S2 times, um, okay, so here I wrote uh, T star S1, this is the cylinder. Um, uh, symplectic people like it a lot um, to, to, to view some things as a cotangent bundle because it comes with a canonical symplectic form. Um, and we know that that the, the, the moment image of uh, S2 is the, is the segment and the image of the cylinder is R. So we get, we get this moment map image here. Um, the same principle for C2, where you have a half line times half line, which will give you a, a quadrant. Of course, you can play this game in higher dimensions. C3, C4 will be exactly the same. Um, but of course, there are four dimensional, uh, four dimensional toric manifolds, which are not products. For example, CP2 is such, a, such an example. And I will talk about CP2 in, in detail, uh, I hope. <laughs> um, and so what happens in principle is that it looks like C2 exact for, uh, ex 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 except for the fact that we have compactified it somehow by adding, by adding a divisor in infinity. And this you can read off basically from, the, from, this, from this moment map picture because if you look at the pre-image of the segment here, inside of CP2, 
you'll find that it, it's a copy of CP1. And this is the, the device. Um, so I guess my point is that you can understand many things about the geometry by looking at these, uh, at these, at these pictures. And what you can also do is take blowups and make them and take them in a way so that they are compatible with the toric structure. And blowups blow in, in the toric world, they just, they just correspond to chopping off uh, vertices um, of, your, of your manifold. I mean, of your, of your del Zand polity. And you can chop off uh, vertices of different sizes and this does not change. This does not change the topology of the space that you obtain, but it changes the symplectic form. So the symplectic form sees the sizes somehow of your of your um, of your polytope, not only the combinatorics of the group. Um, the topology only sees the the combinatorics of the polytope, not which facet has which size. Um, and then you can do multiple blowups, for example. One of my favorite spaces is the threefold blow up of CP2. <laughs> so you chop off three corners. Um, what if you blow up four times? Which, which part you're going to chop off? Oh, you can choose. I mean, for example, why not do it like this? This would work. Um, you can do it as many times as you like, I think. Um, it's just that uh, you don't necessarily get monotone. Tor so if you know what monotone means in the symplectic world, uh, you, you cannot get monotone ones at, at, at some point, but uh, you can continue chopping off these, these corners. And um, basically the del Zand condition will tell you that the, the result will always be del Zand. I, I hope this is true. <laughs> Why you used to, you used to chop off? It doesn't have to be parallel to a side, right? Any line uh, in a corner. Sorry, you, you... The line you use to chop up, like in the right picture, that line need not be parallel to a, a side of this. Ah, um, but I need to do it in a way so that this... Um, remember that the... The polytope that we want to obtain has to be has to be smooth again, so it has to satisfy this del Zand condition on polytopes. And basically, if you fix if you fix a vertex, actually the way in which you chop off is also fixed. So I really have to be parallel here to to the. I mean, it. The point is not that it's parallel to the side, but the point is that it is compatible somehow with with um, with the structure here around this vertex. And if you look here, if you look at this polytope, for example, then you can see that the smoothness condition is still valid. But if I chopped off in a different way, so like this, for example, then I break this, um, this smoothness condition. Does this answer the question? How do you, how do you check you broke the smoothness condition? You go back to... Ah, you go to the definition. Maybe we can do it. I mean, it's not that. So let's look at, okay, so let's look, let's say instead of, instead of chopping off in, in this way, I do it like this. So let's say I've created, um, I've created, um, maybe I have some space to draw. Let's say I've created something like this here. Right, so here I'm just looking at kind of a magnified version of, yes. of what, what I've drawn. And now, as, now I need to write some numbers because we need to be precise about what the angle here is. And let's say here we have um, minus one, minus one, this vector. And this one is um, one minus one, okay? Well, this is not this is not um, smooth because I can I can either apply your remark from before and see that the parallelogram uh, contains a point, or I can just compute if 
if one is uh, if you you prefer computation then maybe you can just compute the determinant and we'll see that here we get uh, uh, minus two so it's mm -hmm. To check this, do I have to do this for every near every vertex? There's also yes, yes, oh, yes. Okay. I see. Okay. Very restrictive condition, yeah. <laughs> but what I was what I was thinking about before is, um, I I think you can always so if you have such a such a smooth let's say we are in this picture here, if we are if we have a smooth the smoothness condition holds, then we can always do the blow up and always chop off a corner so that it works. But I think the angle at which you do it is then fixed once you have chosen a vertex by the condition. I think I have to start right by writing vectors, two vectors, and then this condition determinant one. Mm -hmm. condition. Yes. And it will tell me the yeah. direction which I should chop. Mm. Uh, actually, it's easy to see that this can always be done because uh, one thing I haven't told you, but which is very important, is that. All of the, we have the symmetry group sitting around this GLN Z somehow. We can just change the lattice by GLN Z. And all of the, all of the vertices having the Del Zant condition are basically equivalent to one to each other. Meaning that the, the angle might look strange when you draw it, but you can always map it via your, your symmetry group to the, to the standard angle. And so you only need to verify that you can you can chop off at a standard angle um, in one possible way. Then you have it for all other angles because the symmetry group acts. Okay, great. Uh, and just, just a quick reminder: there's about ten minutes left. Yes, I know. Uh, I'm very sad about. This. <laughs> okay, uh, I will. I will move on. Um, yes. So. Here are some some three dimensional pictures, um, and um, so the first one is CP three, which is a simplex. Then we have a cube, which is again a product, and uh, C three, which will be important later on. So the positive orthant, basically. And um, so one more, just one more remark about about the toric geometry somehow of this of this stuff which i found very very important um so we, you can think of this of this moment map in the toric case as kind of a vibration mapping m to this to this polytope and um the fibers of this so the pre-image is let's say this point x look at the pre-image the fibers are always tori topologically they're always tori and um, if you if you are over the interior, then it's a, it's a torus of the of dimension n. And um, if you move to the boundary, so let's say we move here to a to a one dimensional boundary stratum, then there's one of the directions. I mean, one of the one of the subgroups of the of the torus basically is collapsed. So. Um, it's exactly what happens in this in this in this circle. I mean, in the sphere picture, right? So we only have S one, and if you move to the to the to one of the two extremal points, the circle gets collapsed. And if you move to to a zero dimensional boundary stratum, both both um, circles get 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 collapsed basically, and you you're left with a point. So and this holds in general. So your your fiber over over a given point is equal is, is a torus and its dimension is equal to the dimension of the corresponding face in which you are. Um, this must be how you prove the Azan's theorem. You suggest. Yes, this is what I mean. This is the naive way to prove the Azan's theorem. You you do your polytope times a torus, there is a natural symplectic form on it, but then you need to take care of how the how you get. How you collapse it? Um, how you collapse things at the at the boundary of the polytope? And this collapsing thing is actually hard to do by hand. So this is why this is why people this is why one does symplectic reduction in a sense. Yeah. But you're right. This is uh, this is one way of viewing it intuitively. Um, and 
something else I wanted to say is that these fibers are exactly the orbits of the TN action. So we, we know that the Hamiltonians were preserved under their flow, but now we have the flow is the action and the Hamiltonians are grouped together in this moment map. So the moment map is preserved. And, um, and in the toric case, the, the fibers are exactly the orbits. So we can view this moment map as kind of a quotient map of the action. Okay. Let's at least, I would like to at least finish um, the, the example of CP2, uh, which contains all of the ingredients somehow of the general Delzant story, but um, which is less, uh, which requires less notation and so on. Um, Okay, so the idea here, the idea here is to is to um, reconstruct CP two um, with its symplectic form. So basically, our goal here would be construct CP two with oops with its symplectic form, the Fubini study form. Uh, which is the standard kind of symplectic form in CP2. And then also reconstruct somehow the toric structure, meaning this T2 action, Hamiltonian T2 action on CP2. And the way we do it is we start with, with a C3, the, just as you do it if you define if you define CP2, you might think of it as a, as a set of equivalence classes on, on vectors of, of C3. Well, you would need to remove the origin, but okay. And our, our goal is kind of to, to, to have a symplectic version of this. So to, to get in this construction, get a, a symplectic form on CP2. And this can be done using, using symplectic reduction. Um, so first we need the toric structure on C3. This we've already kind of talked about because uh, we know that it's, it, the, the Delzant polytope will be the positive orthant. Um, and the action is, is, is just the product of the actions by rotation that I mentioned at the beginning, at the very beginning of my talk. So I just, I just um, multiply by um, just use complex multiplication component-wise to find this action. And this is generated by them by this moment map here, going to which maps to the squares of the, um, of the modules. And what I do now is um, I restrict my attention to somehow a, a, a circle in this copy of T3. So I take the diagonal, this diagonal circle here. Um, and there's kind of a relationship between, so let's say you have a Hamiltonian group action and you take a subgroup of your group. So you fix H in G maybe. Then this action is again, automatically Hamiltonian. So you can restrict to subgroups. And there's a recipe by which you can obtain the, the new moment map from the old moment map. And if you apply this recipe here in the case of this inclusion, the diagonal inclusion of the circle, then you get, then you get this Hamiltonian here. So basically what I'm saying is you can either fix the subgroup or H, those are equivalent. And one always yields the other. Um, and uh, I would call this the induced Hamiltonian, maybe this terminology is not that important. And what I do now is I move to, I move to, the, to the level set, to a level set of this Hamiltonian. So I fix, so for convenience, I fixed one. So one in R, and I look at the corresponding level set. And this is just a copy of the, of the five sphere because of the definition of the Hamiltonian. So if you look at this formula here, just give you this, the five sphere. And what we obtain here 
um, what we get is that um, since the flow preserves this, this level set, I get an induced S1 action. So this, the copy of S1 acts on, preserves this, uh, this five sphere. And if I mod out by this action, I get CP2. That's one of the, one of the possible definitions of, of CP2. And um, this is the classical hop vibration in one dimension higher. Right? So in, in, in the, let's say in the, in the classical version of the hop vibration, maybe you would have C2, S3, and CP1, or CP1 being, being the same as S2. And the point is that what symplectic reduction allows you to do is to make this whole thing, um, make this whole thing symplectic. Namely, if you do this with respect to moment map and the corresponding action induced by the moment map, then you get an automatic kind of symplectic form here. So you get this for free, basically. I mean, for free, knowing symplectic reduction. So originally I had planned to talk about symplectic reduction in more generality later on, but maybe we won't get to this. Um, Is this supposed to be evident? That, uh, you no, no okay. not at all. Not at all. This needs some reflection. Um, yes. Um, and the last question that I'd like to briefly discuss is, um, so where's the toric structure in all of this? I've reconstruct. I've done the first step now, basically, of, of what I wanted to do. I've I've so modulo symplectic reduction, of course. I've I've um, constructed a symplectic form on CP two, but now I'd like to have um, the toric structure. So I'd like to have a a T two action, Hamiltonian T two action. And maybe so. I know that I'm running out of time, but maybe can you can you guess where this T two action comes from? Um, it's a very natural thing to do somehow. So this goes back to this goes back to the way that I've set up things because. For now, we haven't really used so on on C three we had a T three action, so of the an action of the three torus. But this I haven't used for now. I've only used a sub action, namely a circle action, as a subset of this three torus. But there remains the the rest of the T three action basically, and this projects down to C two. So, kind of, we want this Hamiltonian T two action on C P two. And what we do is we we start with this with the, with the three torus action on C three, and one can see that quite easily see that this is this action restricts to S five, so this five sphere is preserved. But then I look at the action coming from coming from basically the quotient of T three. By, by S1. And this gives me well-defined action on, on CP2. Which... Can you question the diagonal? This is the diagonal? Uh, uh, yeah, the, this, that's the diagonal action. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the circle action is still the diagonal action. And um, so this is called somehow residual action. And well, one can prove that this is Hamiltonian. Um, by, by writing down, it's not that hard, by writing down a diagram, you can guess what the moment map should be. And then you check that this is the moment map in a sense. Um, okay, let me cut it short a little um, since, since I think, maybe I can, maybe I can, I can stop here. So, uh, of course, the part that's missing now, in a sense, is um, how do you get how how do you get this this S one action basically? So how how can you read off from the moment polytope this S one action by which you need to reduce? Because 
now I've introduced it just as something which fell from the sky, basically. And there's some, there's some trick or some combinatorics which you can do on the moment polytope, which tells you that the, the action by which you should reduce is precisely um, this diagonal uh, circle action. And this is kind of what the general Del Zand construction gives you. Um, and, but but it's, mu it's much more general than that. It works for any toric, uh, for any toric manifolds. Um, okay, maybe I, I will stop here. And then if there are questions, I can go into more details for some things. So. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joe. That was a great talk. Let's thank, uh, thank our speaker. Um, and now we'll do questions. So uh, I will put in the chat one more time a link to the uh, Jamboard. So this is a just a link to a Google Jamboard or where you can write. Uh, so if anybody has questions and they, they would like to write something, you can write on there and uh, we, every, anybody can see it. So with the link. Um, right, so are there any questions? Yeah, my question is that inclusion at the bottom. So see, you are including CP2 into C3. Oh, you... yes, I mean, okay, I didn't talk about this, but okay. Um, no, the inclusion is on the level of polytopes. So this is, um, okay, this is this can be taken as a hint on on, on the Delzon construction. So, okay, um, we have seen that the, the polytope of CP2 is this um, is this simplex here, and this simplex can be included in a in a certain in a certain way um, in the moment polytope of C three. So C three was the was basically I mean the moment polytope was basically this positive um, the positive orthant, and if you do this inclusion in the right way. It, um, it tells you which reduction to do. So, because if you look at, if you look at on, on the other side, the equation defining this, um, defining this triangle sitting in R3 is, um, is just the equation X, X plus Y plus C equal, equals to one. But the coordinates on, the coordinates on your um, on R three are just the modules of the uh, the complex modules squared. So it gives you this equation here on um, on the side of CP three, and this defines this defines um, S five, and you can also see that it is basically um, you take your moment map and You evaluate it. I mean, okay. You, you take the standard scalar product and you evaluate it on on one one one. But this one 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 vector is basically the one 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 vector telling you which inclusion of S one to use. I mean, this one 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 is the. It gives you, if you exponentiate it, it gives you this thing here. And this tells you by which circle to reduce. So, on the on the level of on the level of polytopes, you have the inclusion, and on the level of spaces, this inclusion, if it is nice enough, it gives you a, a reduction scheme going from from um, from C three with symplectic reduction to C B two. So there's no. Does this answer the question? Yeah, you see, you say it's inclusion, but uh, the polytope corresponding to C three is just three line, right? It's not the you know the space like three dimensional thing. It's not a, it's just a three line. And no, 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 you... it's it's no, no, no. I mean, no, the the, the moment polytope of C three is um, R three with positive coordinates. I mean, oh, no, I see, I see. Okay, sure, sure, sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
If I take different uh, inclusion, would I get a different fibrillation, uh, but it would be uh, symplectic, right? I mean, if I just cut, cut up the different plane, I still get. Mm. So this inclusion has to, in order for, in order for the reduction to work, so in the reduction, there are some hypotheses you need to, you need to act freely on the level set so that you can, you can have the, you can have the quotient manifold. And if you take different inclusions, I think you will violate, you will always violate something in the symplectic reduction. So if you take maybe another inclusion would be, I don't know if you would tilt your plane a little. So maybe you, you take, instead of taking one, 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 you would take one, one, two. So this would be a tilted inclusion of the, of the triangle. Um, I don't think this would work. Mm. Yes, so the problem would be that if you exponentiate this, you, you, you would get something like, uh, you would get some action like this. So you have a two there. This is the difference. You have a two. And um, this will not act, this will not act freely on, on the level set. Because if you go to, you can go to, hmm. Now I need to pick some points in C3. Um, oh, of course I can always take the first ones equal to zero and the last one equal to something non-zero. So Z3 non-zero. Then I will, I will have some, um, some stabilizer there because um, I, I, I turn around twice. So if I, if I, set, if I set this theta equal to uh, one half maybe, then I will get, I will, um, I will have a stabilizer. And this does not, this does not work with, uh, with symplectic reduction. Because, because one of the things you need in symplectic reduction is that, is that this already works on the level of manifolds. So you need to have a, and in order for a, for a group action on a manifold to have a quotient manifold, the action needs to be free. So I think this is maybe the only inclusion that works in the kind of regular setup. Um, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So can we like, for example, commute, compute the homology or something of these symplectic manifolds from their polytopes? Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, I mean, okay, the kind of, the kind of um, stupid answer to this is you, you have to be able to do it because you can reconstruct the whole manifold, right? But, but the answer is yes, and there are explicit there are explicit things. I mean, there are explicit um, recipes to to compute this. Um, the whole the whole cohomology ring, for example, can be there is a nice there is a nice description um, of the whole cohomology ring in terms of the in terms of the polytope. If you want to Google this, I mean, this this cohomology story is. Uh, I think it's due to Stanley Reisner. At least, at least there's something called the Stanley Reisner ideal, which you which is some ideal that you quotient out of some of some um, um, polynomial ring, and um, this gives you a complete description of, of cohomology, for example. Okay, thank you. Are, are there any other questions? <laughs>